grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Before you sit down, the basis of today's sermon is our gospel lesson, that of two well-known sinners who come before God to pray. It is Cain and Abel all over again. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You can be seated. As you just heard, Jesus' original audience were those who trusted in themselves, thinking that they were righteous. And so they treated others who were not like them with contempt. So in their thinking, that is the thinking of the Pharisees, it was their goodness and their decency and their works and their self-discipline and their piety that made them better than anybody else, which was why God accepted them. Nobody can compete with us, they thought. We are the chosen ones. God is pleased. So Jesus directs this parable to them. Now as I said over in the adult Bible study, some of Jesus' parables, they require explaining by Jesus. This is why the disciples many times would say, what do you mean by that? This one does not require much explanation at all. Jesus tells of two men who go to the temple to pray, taking their stand before God. For one, this was part of his daily routine. I mean, you could, you could set your watch by him. He always showed up, and he's always on time. And listen, let's just forget for a few moments the prejudice that Jesus Frequent or Jesus' frequent stinging remarks about Pharisees have formed in our minds. I mean, we have to give this particular Pharisee all the credit that we possibly can. He is, after all, a good man. I mean, if you were to choose one of these men to marry your daughter, you'd pick the Pharisee, hands down. It's the Pharisee that you would hire to work at your house. It was the, it's the Pharisee that you would try to get to join your country club or your church or your bowling league. It's the Pharisee that you would have over for dinner. It's the Pharisee that you would ask to be the godparent of your child. It's the Pharisee who you would call in an emergency. Listen again to his prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He boasts, I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I give. Folks, fast twice a week? None of us do that. We rarely give up anything for Lent. Tithe all we get? I doubt that. For most, God just gets our leftovers. This man's a role model for society. He is a pillar in the community. Somebody get him a box of envelopes, please. Clearly, God hears this man's prayer because he's innocent. He deserves to be heard. He's nothing at all like that other man. The other man, what a sellout. What a crook. He sold his soul a long time ago to the Roman occupiers, collecting therefore from his fellow Jews all that he could bleed out of them. All he has to do is pay the authorities an agreed upon flat fee and anything above and beyond that is money in his bank. To associate with him is treason. 
He is despicable. There's something different about it. Though we cannot hold a candle to the Pharisee regarding outward righteousness or inward discipline or religious piety, he recognizes that sin has pumped through his veins, it's pumped its poison through his veins, and there is no breast to beat but his own. Miracle. Miracle. Mia Maxi. It's my fault, my own fault, my most grievous fault. Moreover, he stands far off, probably in the shadows where he's not easily seen, but he is seen. He's seen by God, and he is seen by this proud Pharisee who makes his comparison not even lifting his eyes to heaven. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Actually, it's the sinner. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. This man knows that his works, no matter what they may be, cannot justify him ever. This man knows that he is guilty, and thus he stands terrified, he stands afflicted, and he stands ashamed, hoping God does not give him what he truly deserves. You know, Jesus here is summing up all human beings in this one account. For all stand before God, either trusting in themselves, their own goodness, their own righteousness, quick to point out their superiority over others, or they come with empty hands of faith with a burdened conscience, asking the Lord for mercy, asking the Lord for the forgiveness of their sins without thinking of anyone else. Mia, 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 Maxi. You know, at different times in his life, St. Paul was each one of these men. You know that he started out as a Pharisee, just like the guy in the account, proud of his accomplishments, denying his own sinfulness, claiming to be righteous before God, and doing what? Looking down on other people as the real sinners. And if we could just get rid of them... Then God showed him how great a sinner he was. The law shut up Paul's justifications and he was filleted. Yet God took pity upon him. He humbled him. Brought him to repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul, get this, Paul went from this Pharisee kind of sinner who stood condemned before God to being the other kind of sinner. A penitent, humbled sinner, justified though by faith in Christ. Most of you know that I was not raised Lutheran. And when I first started investigating the Lutheran distinctives and actually then attending a Lutheran church, I hated the liturgy. Hated it. It didn't make sense to me. It was like reading a foreign language that I had never seen, never even heard in my life. Because my whole life was used to being busy before God. Being active before God. And this involved all kinds of things. My praise, my devotion, my intensity, my commitment, my discipline, my passion for the Lord. Boy, I took pride in it all. As Luther would say, would say, I was a very good theologian of glory. But it took time. It took study. It took repentance. But I learned that the liturgy actually keeps us from acting like the Pharisee in this parable. For example, when we attend a divine service, we don't get tennis elbow patting ourselves on the back of 
how good we are. We can't. You know why? Liturgy won't let you. It's no accident that the divine service begins with each one of us as a lost cause where we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, sinning against you, Lord, in thought, word, and deed. In other words, I'm guilty. We're throwing our lot at that moment in with the tax collector. And we have nothing to give God except our sin and our death. Praise be to God, the liturgy does not leave us there. It leads us to something actually quite wonderful, and that is the absolution, where one hears, I forgive you of all of your sins. We just sang it. It's Christ who says that through the minister. I forgive you all of your sins. You know, I used to go to a Lutheran church on Saturday night before I would go to my evangelical church on Sunday. I remember speeding to get to the Lutheran church so I could hear that pastor say, I forgive you of all of your sins. I didn't want to miss that. I need to hear it. Faith cometh by hearing. And I needed to hear that. It's the liturgy. The liturgy leads you confess, to confess, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And what you hear is, peace be with you. The liturgy then leads you to hear Christ's words, this is my body and my blood for your forgiveness. And then you sing, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And then finally, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you leave here justified just like the tax collector. That's why Luther says that the church rises and falls on the doctrine of justification. So over and over, the liturgy leads you to the most important gift of all, the forgiveness of your sins, turning you away from being this busybody, prideful Pharisee towards the tax collector who receives God's gifts passively, whereby you readily acknowledge that you cannot justify yourself before God, or trying to do so is like climbing a rope of sand. And then having been justified, you're pushed out into the world to go and do some good for your neighbor. It's very interesting that these men, they arrive at the temple at the evening sacrifice. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. What this means is, is that it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At the evening sacrifice, just like in the morning sacrifice, there was a lamb that was offered along with oil, Grain and wine. Get that. Grain and wine. Huh. Grain and wine pointing to the Lord's Supper. The Lord promised to be there to meet with His people, granting forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so these two men are at the temple at this same precise time. The tax collector knows God is there, for He promised to be so. Yet He can't even look up, saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. However, instead of employing the typical term for mercy, a liaison, he used a different word altogether. He uses a term that's fitting to the location. Now remember, this is within the temple precinct. The smoke of the sacrifice can be seen. The tax collector prays, God provide atonement for me, the sinner. He's referring to the sacrifice. He knows that an innocent animal is going to lose its life in place of guilty sinners. Guilty sinners just like him. 
so that God might turn his wrath away and instead show mercy. The Pharisee, as you know, is there at the same time. Who does he pray about? Himself. He points God to his works. And just like Cain in our Old Testament lesson, the Pharisee and his sacrifice are rejected. Do you remember when Jesus cried to Telestai, it is finished? When was that? It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Because he hung on the cross from 9 until 3. Meaning that he died when? At the evening sacrifice. As we sing in the liturgy. <coughs> Thus the blood of all those sacrificial lambs were but a shadow pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Beloved, our Lord has heard you confess, I am by nature sinful and unclean. And because of what He has done, dying during the evening sacrifice, you leave here today as the tax collector. Justified. Which is what God does to you. Giving you a righteousness a righteousness that is not your own, even giving you a holiness, a holiness that is not your own either. And as your lips cry out for mercy that you have not merit, or what you have not merited or deserved, Jesus pours upon your lips his very body and his very blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Folks, this is how serious God is about saving sinners like us and keeping us in the one true faith all the days of our life. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.